Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. We've talked a lot recently about drones and so on and uh, what you need to do to fly a drone legally, if you're going to be shooting commercial footage with it and so on. But an interesting ruling came down recently involving filming in national parks. Not with drones, just filming in national parks. Chris sent me a note and said, hey, Steve, check out the cool article by NPPA.org, NPPA.org. And it simply has to do with filming inside a national park if you're filming for commercial purposes, right? And that, of course, is what caused the trouble with the drone flights is uh, some people are accused of making drone flights for commercial purposes without the proper licensing and so on, and they got in trouble. But today we're simply talking about commercial filming inside national parks. The headline says federal court holds National Park Service film permitting rule unconstitutional. Alicia Calzada wrote it, and the NPPA is an organization we'll talk about in a second, but they're celebrating a victory for videographers after a federal judge struck down a portion of the Department of Interior film permit requirements recently. The judge ruled that the commercial filming permit uh, violates the First Amendment and uh, the judge also issued an injunction stopping enforcement of the rule. The National Press Photographers Association, the NPPA, as part of its partnership with the First Look Media Works Press Freedom Defense Fund, drafted and filed an amicus brief in the case, which is joined by nine other organizations. The ruling overturns commercial film permit requirements in the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So up until now, if you wanted to film in a national park, you had to apply for a permit. And uh, that is now no longer necessary, at least for a commercial film. In her ruling, the judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia declared that the statute and the regulations that enacted it, requiring those engaged in commercial filming to obtain permits and pay fees, it's unconstitutional. The court also found that the permit rules restrict speech in public forums, including the many national park locations that are already considered traditional public forums, such as the National Mall. So we think of national parks, we tend to think of just, you know, wide open spaces on the Great Plains. But actually, the National Park Service has jurisdiction over a lot of other stuff. The court found that the rules were content-based restrictions on speech, and that's often what they look at. We all know we've got a freedom of speech. And there are some limitations on a freedom of speech. But the question is, when they make a limitation and they say, oh, you can speak here, but not about this, it's content-based. And that is often a problem. So likewise, the judge found the regulations and underlying reasons offered by the government do not meet that strict level of scrutiny. And what they were talking about was uh, they wanted to obtain a fair market payment uh, on top of any administrative costs. They were, in essence, just charging people to film. Just you know, we'll make some money. The government may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution, including the First Amendment right to free expression, the judge wrote. The case is a great victory for, ta- for photographers and the right to record in public spaces. And PPA Executive Director Akili Kasundria Ramses said, in the regulations that were overturned, the government defined commercial broadly as being for a market audience with the intent of generating income, which sounds a lot like the rules they were talking about with the drones. Although representatives of the news media were already exempted in the statute, the question of who qualifies as a representative of the news media is not well defined. And in an era where more and more journalists are independent, NPPA believed the definition was a threat to freelance visual journalists as well. And then that's the question, am I a journalist? I've never called myself one. But I'm often posting videos talking about news and, you know, so, I don't know. And then there are a lot of people out there who go out there and film stuff who aren't working for anybody and they're hoping to post the video and a lot of it is of newsworthy events. So they often call themselves journalists and they are. They might not be drawing a paycheck from a traditional journalism institution, but that's not necessary. Um, One of the attorneys in the case praised the decision. This case started when the Park Service tried to criminally cite Gordon Price for unobtrusively making a film in a public park. Gordon fought for his rights and prevailed, and this is his attorney speaking. The court's decision reaffirms that the act of filmmaking is protected by the First Amendment, that government cannot condition this right with arbitrary permit and fee requirements. Price is an independent filmmaker from Virginia, and he filmed portions of a low-budget feature film at the Yorktown Battlefield in the Colonial National Historical Park. 
After the film premiered and garnered some attention, the National Park Service issued him a citation for failing to obtain a commercial permit. When Price's attorney challenged the constitutionality of the permitting statute, NPS dropped the charges but expressed an intent to continue enforcing the permit requirement in the future. And that's another game that some people play is there's a law on the books and you run afoul of it. So they, they, they say, well, we need to fine you for that. The second you challenge, they go, oh, never mind. And they hope you go away because someone else will come by after you and they'll find that person hoping they won't challenge it. So it's good that they pursued this even after the alleged fine had been dropped. The regulations required a permit for all commercial filming. The requirement was regardless of the size of the camera or a crew, irrespective of the disruptiveness of the filming activity. For more than a decade, NPPA has advocated against park permit requirements based on anything other than the level of disruption and has fought against charges for filming that are based on whether or not a work will generate a profit. And that's the interesting thing. Everybody understands that if a Hollywood blockbuster wants to film a movie uh, in a national park and it's going to cause a big section of the park closed off because they're going to have all these trailers and stuff, and sets and lights and wind machines and stuff, and, and it makes it so where people who are visiting the park can't visit a portion of the park because they can't, there's a movie set there now. You'd understand that they would charge you something for that. That makes sense. Uh, you know, I, it makes sense to me at least. But the idea that nowadays when a camera can be, you know, simply something that's on your phone or a GoPro camera, which they make GoPro cameras that are literally about that big, okay? A couple inches by a couple inches, a little cube, okay? That's a GoPro camera. You can film with that. And it films very, very good imagery, and it also films good sound, believe it or not, under the right conditions. And so the idea that we're going to charge you a permit fee, whether or not you've got the GoPro camera and nothing else, or a, a gigantic crew of several hundred, and we're tying up a portion of the park for a week. That doesn't make any sense either. So that's always a problem when they apply a single standard to everyone, and then they basically punish the people at the one end of the spectrum as if they're at the other end. So in 2007, then NPPA president Tony Overman testified in Congress against the enactment of this rule. Now, the rule has been overturned now, but of course, that was 07. So 13, 14 years ago, NPPA warned against adopting arbitrary laws aimed at the photography itself and urged Congress to focus its regulations on activities that would impact the park, such as damage to resources or interference with public visitors. Uh, there are some famous examples of movies that were shot where they had to really, really disrupt the area. Uh, I'm thinking of an example right now that did not happen in America, but when they filmed The Beach with Leonardo DiCaprio uh, over, I believe, in Thailand, uh, there were some locals very, very upset about the disruption to the local beach there because of what they had to do to shoot the film and how hard it was to get it back to the way it was before these people showed up. So it makes sense that if a filmmaker is going to do something that disruptive, that you might need to you know, keep an eye on and possibly charge them a fee. But the idea that simply somebody walking along with a GoPro camera or their phone needs to pay a fee if they use the film for the wrong purpose uh, is, in my mind, a little goofy. Um, NPPA back then said that the rules would have a negative effect on independent journalists and filmmakers. Uh, they outlined, again, in its amicus brief, in this case, the same argument, the vague and overbroad definition of commercial equates the impact of a large-scale Hollywood production to that of a single photographer with a single camera operating in an open public space. In her analysis of the law, the judge noted NPPA's amicus brief and the fact that the NPS intent of protecting the resources of the park system had no relationship to what happens after a film is created. So them saying that if you're going to do this for commercial purposes, we charge you this, it's for non-commercial purposes, we don't even look at it. And yet, shooting the film is exactly the same act. And that's the problem. So I suspect what they'll do is they'll rewrite these rules. And hopefully they'll rewrite them in a way that makes sense. And that, of course, gets us to the obvious question. If the National Park Service cannot 
charge a permitting fee for someone to shoot a commercial film in a park over a non-commercial film. What's the difference then with a drone, a drone being used anywhere? I'm not, not just talking about national parks. I'm talking about let's compare the national park permitting rule with the FAA's rules regarding commercial use of a drone. And it doesn't take a big stretch to realize there's a parallel there. So if the federal courts look askance <laughs> at charging a permitting fee based on the type of shooting you're doing regardless of anything else, Likewise, it seems to me that you can make the same argument that if a drone is up in the air and it's flying around filming something, the fact that it's being filmed for a commercial purpose doesn't really change what it's doing, what impact it has on the environment and so on. So uh, I suspect that what we're going to see now is someone challenging the FAA drone rules uh, and saying, look at this case and see the parallels as obvious as they are. And some of you will notice, however, that we mentioned when this whole thing went down, because it went down originally in 2007. And of course, this is now 2021. So here we are, 14 years later, and a federal court has finally struck down a statute that was probably uh, unconstitutional on its face. And I've had a lot of people ask me, why does it take so long for stuff like this to happen? And as noted, the NPPA.org, the, 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 the group behind helping get it, this done, uh, was complaining about this back in 07. But to get a case like this, you need to have a party that can claim they were harmed by it. And so a photographer who got fined can say, I've been harmed by this. And so it might be that other people they find didn't complain, or maybe they simply you know, hadn't find the, the, the wrong person yet, as they say. So Chris sent it to me, thanks a lot. But a federal court has held National Park Service film permit rule is unconstitutional. So they got to go back and rewrite it. In the meantime, they cannot enforce it. NPPA.org ran the article written by, uh, small type, Alicia Calzada. Great article. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Leto's Law. Let the sun beat down upon my face and stars fill my dream. I'm a traveler of both time and space to be where I have been.